Welcome back, Sales Beast listeners. We're here for another episode, and we're so, so thankful to have Hassan on with us today. Hassan, welcome to Sales Beast. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, I've only been with the team for a couple of years. I've been listening to your show. I'm an avid listener, as Mike already knows. Um, almost every single podcast, I listen to it while I'm driving. So, yeah, I never thought I'd be on here, but I'm really happy to be on here. <laughs> yeah, honestly, he's probably our biggest fan. I love it. And you've earned the spot to now come on and join us as a guest. So welcome. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Um, For our listeners, why don't you just give us a quick rundown of your career in real estate so far, kind of uh, where you've been and uh, where you're at now? Yeah. So um, I got into the business about a couple of years ago. Um, um, I was an engineer before that, electrical engineering. I did that in school and I was working in consulting for a couple of years. Um, So that was a pretty cool job. I got to travel quite a bit. Um, and then while I was looking for work after school, I started, I, I started on my licensing process and, um, I thought, you know what, even if I don't do it full time, it'll be something nice to have. And then, uh, it turns out I absolutely hated my job and, uh, the timing and the constraints that it came with and the, the glass ceiling and corporate that everyone, everyone knows right about. So I thought, you know what, um, I, I, and then I, that motivated me to finish my license and um, I had that in my hand and uh, I was in one of these group chats and I mentioned anyone, if, the, if anyone is a real estate agent in that group and there's a, there's a ton of people in that group chat. So uh, Jared Kay, who used to be on our team before, um, reached out and said, hey, you know what? Um, I think uh, what we're doing in Hamilton is, uh, might interest you. And he asked me a bunch of questions. I said, hey, you know, I'm also looking to focus on the investment side of things. So um, he said, hey, let's, uh, let's uh, connect for a coffee and uh, we can chat more about it. And uh, he gave me the rundown on the property, the, the things that uh, everyone was doing on the team, Sandy, Adrian, and um, uh, the transactions that Mike was, uh, was, you know, turning over every single year and whatnot. I thought, hey, you know what, this sounds like a great opportunity. So spoke with Sandy, met with him, and uh, honestly didn't interview any other teams. I was sold. Um, apparently, now I found out that Sandy is a really good, um, he's really good at selling the dream to all new agents and whatnot. So um i I spoke to him and i spoke to mike a bunch of times and uh, i quit my job and i started full-time and uh yeah so um now i'm in my second full calendar year and sitting at about uh, 350 ish gci and uh that's where i'm at so far that's awesome one thing you mentioned there it sounds similar to my story you i know i had a phone call with you before you joined you didn't ask a ton of questions and you just went all in i know so many people when they join these teams they think yeah i've never done a deal before but there's a split associated with this and it costs a lot to be on a team i would say like it sounds like you're in a similar position to me that wasn't the approach I took, and I don't think it was the approach you took. You just went all in and you wanted to learn as quick as possible. And now you've generated a pretty significant business for yourself. And that's where the world really opens. You will grow within this team if you choose, if you choose not to, you have the opportunity to go on your own and make a ton of money there also. Um, Now that you look back on it, are you happy you made the decision to join the team? A thousand percent squared. (laughs) um yeah so the reason why i went all in was was like i knew that um if i stuck with engineering it'll be harder to get out of that as i'm gonna start progressing with that you know um yeah there's this um designation you can get in engineering it's called a pn professional engineer and you can get that after four years so when i talk to my family about this and i go to my family for quite a um advice quite often they said, hey, they suggested, hey, why don't you get your PNG and then quit? And I said, hey, what's going to be the point then? I'm, I'm going to progress in this world. And I know that I, I'm going to be miserable if I stay within this world. So, um, the, And then when I met with Sandy and when I spoke to you, it seems like you guys had a pretty good structure, right? Um, uh, he gave me that one, uh, 180 day checklist, the six month checklist. And, um, I, and he basically pointed out to me that if you complete all of these activities, there's a very, very low chance that you would, you're going to fail at this business. So, um, yeah, he, he ran some numbers for me and it made sense. And, uh, and I went with it. And I, I think the biggest reason for me, 
uh, to join a team was, was the fact that I knew absolutely nothing about the business. My parents have, have been investors uh, for a long time and um, they're, they just buy and hold properties and sell them at the right time and whatnot. I wouldn't say they're um, really big time investors, but they were active investors, right? So I definitely saw this, uh, saw the potential in this, um, in this world ever since I was a teen or even when I was, uh, when I was in middle school. So, um, yeah, and uh, they encouraged me a little bit and uh, I joined the team and I, and I knew that if I'm working with high producers and high um, investors that are doing amazing things, I'm going to learn a lot, um, a lot faster than I will if I'm on my own. So, yeah, looking back at it, probably one of the best decisions I made. And I'm, I'm sure I'm going to say that even 10 years down the line. Mm, when I look back on your story, it was quite brave and the sense you, I know a little bit about your family. I know you have a brother that's a very high achiever. I know your cultural background, mine too, actually. I come from a family of accountants, um, well-educated parents. I know you were put into a similar bubble to the one that I was put in. Um, mm -hmm. And the expectation was that we would go on, get an education and get another education become an accountant, an engineer, or a doctor. Um, mm -hmm. It was a very brave step that you took to get into real estate. I know yeah, and, that yeah, put a lot of pressure on you. Um, it's, it's very similar to me. I, I, in the beginning, wanted to prove my parents wrong and prove that I could be successful in this. How much of a, of a driver has that been in your business? Um, well, it, I wouldn't say it's the biggest uh, driver. It's personally, I just wanted uh, freedom for myself. And I knew that if I'm working in the corporate world, my, my success will always be limited and it's going to be dictated by someone else. So I wanted to take control of that. I've always been that type of person. Um, so I, I just knew that, you know, if I, if I switch over now, I'm, I'm going to be put up with a lot less risk because I was just a couple of years out of school. I'm still, I was living at home and uh, didn't have that much financial obligations. And um, I said, hey, you know what? This is the time to experiment as, as a lot of people. Um, that culture is growing now more and more, right? That you, you should take more risks and figure out what's, um, what's meant for you, what's your, what your calling is, right? So mm -hmm. um, I thought it would be safer to experiment now versus 10 to 15 or 20 years down the line when I absolutely have had enough, then I would need a more sophisticated plan Whereas now I can just quit and jump into something. And if I don't like it, then I can transition to something else. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's, yeah, it's a lot different when you have a family and kids and responsibilities. But when you get in early on in your life and you have nothing to lose. But, yeah, mm, exactly. 100%. Really. Mm. Yeah. Like if I look at when the two of us started, sometimes I think about, I started this four years ago and a few years before that I was living in a basement apartment as a student. Um, so this wasn't all that scary to get into because I had nothing. How, um, how has it worked out for you? I know you're having a really good year this year. Where are you at in terms of unit sales, gross commission, and where do you anticipate you'll be by the end of the year? Um, I have, um, in terms of GCI, I'm sitting at, uh, I think just a little over 350. Um, and uh, unit sales about 24, 25, I think. With the recent sales, that might be a, a little higher, but uh, yeah, that's where, where I'm at as of last, uh, last one I checked. Um, okay. In terms of the end of the year, um, probably looking at a, at least another five to six transactions. Um, okay. So that should um, hope, hopefully put me over 400,000. Yeah. And I know you, you have your real estate sales business, but you have another business on the side that generates a lot of income for you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I, I know we clash on this and you're all about the bird game and I'm all about the flip game. So um, yeah, I, uh, and this was actually one of my biggest motivators when I, to get into the business. Um, there's this, um, he popped up on my Instagram. There's this guy who, um, his name was Stefan Arneo. He passed away last year. So he was a big inspiration. And I think now that I look back at it, it was, there was a large part of marketing associated with that. And I got his books. I listened to that quite a bit. And um, he basically sold me on the fact that it's possible to do um, do flips and be an investor without having a large sum of money available from your own pocket. Um, so I, I listened to his books and I um, he broke down um, 
all of the methods and I thought, hey, this is awesome and I want to get into this. And then when I thought of the market um, where I can do this proficiently was um, uh, the Hamilton market. Right. Um, I went to school in, in, in Hamilton and I, and I knew that, uh, you know, there's there's lots of older homes there and there's lots of flippers that actively um, actively operate in that market. And I thought to myself, hey, you know, I'm getting my real estate license. If I'm an agent, I probably will get access to those deals first. So, um, you know, it just became a perfect recipe. And, and yeah, so um, in the last, I guess, last year uh, was my first year um, for our first calendar year. And I did uh, one flip, which happened to be one of the biggest flips apparently on the team. Um, so that was a bit of a horror story as well, but it, it, it turned into a pretty, pretty decent paycheck at the end of it. And then I have a few, a couple of flips going on this, uh, actively that should be done in the next couple of weeks. Mm. Can you tell any, everyone about how that flip came to fruition? It was the most successful flip I've ever seen in my life in terms of profit margin. Um, I was there. I saw it. It was disgusting. <laughs> this is our... This is our Halloween episode, so we want to touch on some scary things. Of any realtor I've ever seen in Hamilton, you've encountered some of the scariest houses out there. Um, so talk to us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, how I came across that guy was simply through prospecting. Um, we're, we're all about cold calling on our team, right? Um, and we get that, obviously, from your success. Um, and it's it worked for you. So we're basically mirroring your business. Right. And then, um, making a hundred contacts every single day. And then, um, I came across, so when I spoke to him, um, one of the tenants picked up and, uh, he said, Hey, I'm just a tenant here or whatever. And then I'm glad that, that I asked that one specific question was, do you know if the landlord has any plans of selling the house at all? And, uh, I thought to myself, like, I didn't really have hope, but, you know, just going based off of the script and trying to find a way, um, trying to find a lead somehow one way or another. Um, he said, uh, hey, you know what, the, the owner does live with me um, and he was thinking about selling. So um, I, I marked that down in my notes. I kept on following up um, and credits to you, Anna, uh, for training me on that, on how to um, follow up uh, the right way. So I kept on following up about, it. probably called him about uh, 12 separate times, not all on the same day, obviously, over a span of three or so weeks. And then I was finally able to reach him and book an appointment with him. So I went to go see him and the property was absolutely falling apart. Um, the main structural wall was, um, was sunken in, there was garbage everywhere. And as I was going through the property, <laughs> there, was, uh, there were rats, there were, you know, um, yeah, so there were rats everywhere and garbage everywhere. And uh, while I while we crossed the kitchen, he pointed to the back room and he said, "Hey, make sure you don't touch anything there." My one of the guys that used to live with me passed away, um, passed away just last week, and his like his feces and his other stuff are still there. Um, and yeah, the was, guy you talked to on the phone. No, no, no. That was uh, that was a second buddy that I used to live with him, also his tenant. Um, so yeah, that horrified me a little bit. And uh, this was also one of my first legitimate appointments. And then he took me to the, out out to the back, and I um, and I stepped in a pile of dog poo, and that <laughs> that upset me quite a bit. And uh, yeah, so anyways, I, I come out and um, he said, "Hey, I'm I'm looking to sell the place," but I didn't really like. He wasn't, I guess in the best state of mind at that time. So I said, hey, you know what? I need to speak to someone, one of his family members or someone because he he obviously needs the money and he needs to get this uh, property off his hands. Um, so after a lot of effort, I've, I, I touched base with his brother and uh, spoke to his brother and said, hey, is this something that you guys are actually looking to do? And he said, yeah, we are. So um, went over there with some comparables and some numbers and uh, we negotiated and uh, bought the place at 205. And then, um, yeah, it was. It took longer than expected, about six months, to turn the entire uh, place around. And as we were renovating, the neighbors were literally the full story. That's not the full story. Tell us the full story. So <laughs> you could have closed. What did I miss? Not because of you, but I, I remember being at the house with this oh, yeah, man, yeah. and he couldn't <laughs> move his garbage 
or his belongings, garbage, whatever you want to call it, out of the house. Right. So Hassan being the nice person he is, I remember you offering to order him moving trucks and bring in a company that could help assist him with moving anything. Anyways, I don't want to steal your story to take it from there, but that was a very important important part. Yeah, I remember when we were both standing there and yeah, he was uh, he was obviously under a lot of stress. So I, I tried to make it as easy as possible for him. And uh, yeah, so he wasn't able to move his stuff out. He didn't know where he was going to go. No one from his family was assisting him. So I tried to make it as easy as possible. And obviously, I, I even uh, sent him a few places, uh, some more like, you know, some trailer parks that he was interested in going in, um, into and whatnot. So he defaulted on the closing multiple times simply because, you know, he had plans of moving stuff out, but he wouldn't really implement it um, and he had no help. And then his his neighbors were also they also developed an interest in the property and they thought, you know, as soon as he sells it, there's money is going to pop up everywhere and they're going to, you know, um, they're going to have access to it. But that obviously wasn't the case. So um, unfortunate series of events, he uh, later he did uh, pass away because of uh, uh, a drug overdose um, and then. Yeah, and then I, I can like his brothers reached out and uh, and then we were finally able to close it. Um, I mean, it worked out eventually, but then it was unfortunate that uh, you know we had to go through that. Um, and uh, yeah, that that thought stuck with me quite for a few weeks. But um, yeah, I guess it is what it is. And then uh, life we get to lead as realtors and real estate investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we can make a difference, right? Like you did try to help that guy and it seems like you definitely tried hard, but ultimately it couldn't come to fruition. But the positive end of it is that you were able to turn a home around. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that process and what that was like for you, just overall going through a, a flip for the first time by yourself? Um, what was that experience like? Oh, it was a... Uh... It was a steep learning curve. Honestly, there was so much to learn. Um, there, I, I, I didn't know that uh, buying a house without a basement and just a three foot uh, high crawl space is not ideal. But uh, I knew that it was um, it was at the right price, so um, we could probably do those changes. And then, um, yeah. So I remember I was just standing in there and I was like, "Man, what did I take on?" <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. So um, even the contractor I hired was. Um, he's been my best friend since we were in middle school and um, he's been in the construction business longer than I've been in real estate. So I, I gave the project to him and he, even he hadn't done anything like that. So um, I mean, I hired him and then we were both sort of figuring, uh, figuring it out as we went. So, um, you know, I had to call a bunch of people off uh, trustedpros.com and, uh, and see what kind of numbers they would give me. And also, while they would walk through the property, I would act like I would know, uh, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> At times, I feel like they, they kind of saw through that, but uh, it, it, it taught me a lot uh, at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, we... Um, yeah, I, I called a bunch of people. We fixed up the house structurally and then the interior, I just handed it off to my buddy and then he took it from there. Um, and then I learned a key, a, a few key things in that, in that time was that if the contractors give you a timeline of X, it's always going to be two X and reality. So um, I had projected about three to four months to finish that flip and it ended up taking about eight months. And that was um, through COVID or was that before COVID happened? Um, it was, so we wrapped up right when COVID started in April. Okay. Yeah. Oh, actually, no, uh, sorry. Um, we, it was through COVID. Sorry. I'm, I'm mixing up my years. It was this <laughs> year that we sold it and it was through COVID. Yes. So yeah, even that in itself probably caused a lot of delays. Now mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, project management, getting it to completion, what did that look like? And if you could share, like, what did the numbers look like for you off of your first look? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the numbers were ended up being spectacular. Um, we ended up, uh, so as I mentioned, the purchase price was 205. Um, but since they defaulted on the mortgage quite a, uh, sorry, on the closing quite a few times, um, they ended up giving me a $2,000 discount. So I got a got it at 203. And then the, um, the renovation cost was, I believe, 113 to 117. It was one or the other, but say one, 115. Um, and then I ended up selling that place for 586. Um, holy crap how much yeah. was it in in your pocket um, 
260,000 roughly. Yeah, that's incredible. Quarter million dollars, one flip. And now with the, the money, obviously now you're on to your next two projects. Is Are you dividing those evenly between the two or what, I guess what's your vision overall um, going forward? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm um, I'm not the only one. I, I'm I'm not doing these uh, flips on my own. I'm partnering up with my with my parents as well on it. Um, so the profit is split that way, um, and then uh, all the profit that came from the last one is put it, is being put into the new ones. Right. That's why we're able to do two at, uh, at the same time. Um, one is near McMaster. It's a larger project than even the previous one. Um, obviously, learning more things. Um, there's a, there's a foundation leak that I didn't have to deal with before because simply it was a crawl space, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so there's a foundation leak that I'm dealing with. There's one out in Niagara that I can't, um, that I can't go out to regularly because it's quite a drive from where I am and I'm usually in, uh, in Hamilton. Um, so I check on, um, but the good thing is that I found a pretty trustworthy contractor through, um, uh, through a contact of mine. So. Yeah, so they're going pretty well. Um, they're going to be completed in the next few weeks, and I'm excited to put them on the market. What are you What are you doing to stay organized and focused? Like you're, you've had an incredible, incredible year in terms of real estate sales with 350,000 gross, and you have a lot on your plate with these flips. How do you manage all that? Um, I try to get the contractor stuff out of the way and um and like before noon so 11 to 12 is when i speak to both of them and uh, get updates and whatnot and if they um if i need to organize someone else i, I partially gc it i mean they i do have gcs for both of them but I, like you know if they come back with the ridiculous prices then i then i shop around and i ask my other contact and see if i can get a better price for it um so yeah i just i just time block it with the rest of everything Okay, and specifically with your real estate sales business, this year it's really taken off. Um, especially on the listing side of things, recently it seems like you're signing something every few days. Um, what changed and how can other people listening to this move their business from where you were to where you are today? Join MRN. We'll tell you all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but uh, like I, I honestly mirrored you. Um, you're obviously were very successful in your first uh, first year and obviously all consecutive years as well. Um, this I think the light bulb that went off last year was that I need to stay consistent with the contacts that I'm making and the appointments that I'm going on. Um, I uh, I think the and another bigger uh, another um, I guess turning point was when I joined the scripting call in the morning with uh, Ryan McLean who was a team lead at that time for our brokerage. And he, uh, he scripted us quite well. I saw Sam Kwan, who's also on our team, uh, take off after he joined those calls. And I said, hey, there's gotta be something that they're teaching these agents and they're doing really well right after. Um, so apart from that, just uh, practicing the listening presentation in front of the mirror, I know scripting with other people is great, but you really do take off um, and you really internalize the scripts when you practice on your own when no one is watching. Um, that way you haven't solidified in your head. And when you're in front of clients or even in a scripting call, um, you know exactly um, what objection handle to use and you have a structure for your listing appointments. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I didn't do for the longest time was I, I didn't know how to close my listing appointments. Um, I would go through the entire structure and then at the end, I, I would just twiddle my thumbs and ask, hey, you know what? Um, uh, what do you guys think now after everything? And they'd be like, oh, we need some time to think about it, whatever. So, um, and I wouldn't really have a handle for that. Um, and then I direct, I started directly asking them for business and that started working. So yeah, that's basically it. I know uh, like one of your claims to fame per deal, you seem to put more money in your pocket than the average realtor. So I know Pretty much all of your listings you're signing at six percent and then your buy side deals you're taking home significantly more than the average realtor in our city can we talk about the buy side and how you pull that off and then maybe after we can focus on your listing yeah for sure um i mean the the average commission in uh, hamilton tends to be on the buy side tends to be two percent there that's what they're offering out and uh, i i learned this i guess 
technique from um, from David Belanger. Um, he's he's been with MRN for some time, and I remember him messaging in the group. He sent a little screenshot of him asking an agent that, hey, you know, um, uh, he's asking in the listing agent that for the right offer, will your clients be willing to offer the full two and a half percent? And uh, they said, hey, you know what? Put it on paper, and if the if the number is right, why not? So. Um, yeah, so I, I did that on my very first deal and, and it ended up working out. And then since then, I've been always doing that. Um, so largely part of that is also managing your own client's expectations, right? At the end of the day, um, the sellers are looking to get a uh, deal done and, a, and your client is obviously looking to secure a house. Um, if they keep uh, if they keep lowballing houses, they're never going to get that, uh, never going to be able to get that uh, house that they want. And um, with the way the market is going, they will eventually be priced out. So the way I look at it is that, you know, the sellers are getting the number that they want. My buyers are securing a property and uh, I'm, I'm able to um, get that full two and a half points as well. So it's a win-win for everyone. Mm. What percentage of your buy deals would you say you get paid the additional half point? I think... Uh, since I've started all of them, except maybe a couple. Yeah. Simply just that you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. For anyone listening, maybe if you ask for two and a half percent, rather than just accepting the two that were being provided, you'll get your living proof that you can get paid two and a half percent on every single deal. I don't know anyone else doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when, um, we were sitting down and talking about that extra half point and or, or extra percent even um, on the listing side. And if you really put that into perspective, say you do 20 plus deals over the year and you're getting that extra half every single time, that amounts to an additional five or six deals. If you take that extra half point and divide it over that, um, that's like you doing more transactions than other people. So I feel like a lot of people overlook that and how easily it can add up. Mm, absolutely. Now on the listing side, you're also very successful there. That's where you place most of your attention. Um, you of everyone, I know you sign your listings with the highest commission. How, how do you pull that off? Um, it's just uh, believing in the strategy, right? At the end of the day, um, the 6% is, is obviously not to um, beef up our pockets it also benefits the sellers in the large um, in a large way um, when broken down correctly they really see the value in it and um, it, I think the most important aspect of it is believing in the strategy yourself um, at the beginning I didn't believe in it and I wasn't getting it right um, but then I I gave it some thought and I listened to the Jim Wright's uh, um commission the, the the video the training right and um, he made perfect sense of it that I think, like if you offer a higher commission and you market at a higher commission, more agents tend to flock to your listing, right? Um, we attract the price, we attract the buyer through the price, and then we attract the um, the agents through the commission. So why not use it to our advantage? And then if we don't, if you're not happy with the number that you're netting, ultimately. We can always sharpen our pencils and um, adjust it all the way up until the sellers sign on the dotted line. Yeah, I think uh, recently it's been proven that it works. I don't know if you guys read the article, but it was CDC Marketplace. I guess they went undercover. Um, that just came out today, actually. Clients and actually proved that realtors in Ontario will direct their clients to listings that offer more money. Not saying that's right. Obviously, that's totally wrong and unethical. But what that proves to me is that's the reality of the environment we're operating within. So, as seller representatives, why not use that to our advantage? It's now been proven if you offer more money on your listing, you will attract more buyer agents. Um, and at the end of the day, like like you said, Hassan, that doesn't mean that's what the seller is going to end up paying at the end of the day. If they're not satisfied with either your your work or the the work of the buyer in bringing the offer, there's still room for adjustment. It's just about how you position and how you educate your client. Mm -hmm. 100%. You can see it too through the stats. So the way 
our performance is measured as through the sales to ask ratio, what we sell houses for relative to what we ask for them. And Hassan, I can take your stats. Like this year, you're sitting at about 112% um, and compare you to anyone on any of the fancy billboards in Hamilton. They're about 6% less than you. Um, hmm. So yeah, on average, you charge 1% or 2% more, but you're earning your clients 6% more um, than the average realtor in the city. I think that's part of the reason why. Mm -hmm. Realtors are more excited to sell your listing than anyone else's. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, our team as a whole, we tend to take, um, we, we tend to obviously explain this value proposition of using the 6% uh, commission to, you know, getting the, uh, getting the list, so the, the household at a higher price. So um, I guess to put some numbers behind it for, uh, for the listeners, um, the, the one on Leanster is a prime example. Right, we ended up um, we uh, we ended up getting a bidding war with about eleven offers on the house, and uh, the highest one was at six hundred twenty seven thousand. And then um, through the leverage of the higher commission, I was able to net my sellers another thirty two thousand dollars. If you look at that extra point, it's uh, it's six and a half thousand dollars, and in return you're getting thirty two. I think it's a pretty badass return on your money. Absolutely. And it's risk-free because if it didn't work out in that particular situation, there was always the opportunity for them to make the decision to reduce the commission. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, what I never understood as a seller, I'm going through this now, I'm going through the, the mental strain of offering three and I will offer three on it's a flip I'm about to sell next month. But my goal is to sell that house for 700 grand. I'm perfectly fine listing it 200,000 under. I'm listing it at 499. I struggle offering three points, but it's really the same thing because if I don't get my 700 grand, there's always an opportunity for me to reduce the commission down to two and a half or two. Um, it's the same thing. When we mm -hmm. sell a house, we sell it to two groups of people. We sell it to people that want to buy it and move into it and live in it. And we sell it to realtors. Buyers are attracted by price. Realtors are attracted by commission. That's the rocket fuel formula. Most people only think of buyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we're in a way practicing what we're preaching, right? Even when uh, I sold my flip earlier this year, I offered a higher than average commission. Gary's doing the same thing. You're planning on doing the same thing. Mm. So um, I think the the foundation of this entire success that we're having with this commission is believing in it so strongly. Mm. Absolutely. If you look at one thing I always think about with my investments, for instance, I want to buy my investment where the developers are building. So I, before I buy a property, I go on this website called Buzz Buzz Homes and I see where are the big boys putting up the condo towers. And that's where I want to buy. Um, same thing applies with commission. I'm not well researched. I don't have a massive marketing budget to figure out whether or not three points works better than two or better than one and a half. What I can do though is go on Lozani home site, which is a massive developer, and take a look and see what do they offer their co-op agent. And when you look, it's above, they're not offering two points. They're offering three, four, five, and they're not in the business of throwing money away. They're offering mm -hmm. co-op agents more money because of that they know it will result in a higher sale price. For sure. Absolutely. Mm. It's that classic success leaves clues. Um, mm -hmm. That's the biggest clue you, you ever need, in my opinion. If the biggest developers in Ontario are offering more. We should encourage our clients to offer more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if it's in their best interest, right? That's uh, which mm -hmm. it is. So, so two years in the business, Hassan. Obviously, now three flips, almost successfully completed. Um, I'm sure there's tons of other successes that I can't name right now. But why don't you tell us a little bit about your vision going forward? Where do you see yourself going in the next few years? Um, over the next few years, honestly, uh, Mike asked me this question quite a bit too. Um, I tend to focus on the year that I'm in. Right. Um, and then at the end of the year, plan my vision for the next year. Um, and obviously I do have long-term plans. 
Um, uh, but I try not to cloud myself by thinking about the next year or when this year is, hasn't already completed. Um, so this year, my goal is to obviously hit a certain number of GCI, hit a certain number of transactions, and then um, and see what opportunities there are within the team. Um, that's um, I've, Mike is a big example. You're a big example, Anna, um, that you started off as an ISA at our, on our team, and then you transitioned into the ISA lead role, and now you're a lead of a brokerage, which is simply incredible. And same thing with Mike, right? Um, he did his job the right way. He, uh, I mean, he... Like he was successful and uh, turned like really growing his own business. And now, now he leads about roughly a dozen, dozen agents. Right. So um, yeah, so that's what my focus is for now. Just get really good at one thing and then opportunities seem to open up. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what my focus is. And uh, let's see how it goes. <laughs> I love what you said, because I'm the exact same way. It's so hard for me to like create a vision where I, I like to take people's vision and see how I can make them my own. Um, and of course there's going to be opportunities. You're already killing it. And I'm sure there's going to be an amazing path laid out for you, but it's, it's been amazing to hear your story. Mike, do you have any other questions for Hassan today? Yeah. The same question we ask everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you want to ask it this time? This would be, I'm going to ask time. it. This is my first time ever asking it. Okay, cool. Change it up. All right. This is a question we ask everyone. Who do you know that we should know? that we should have on this podcast. I've or heard that, that many, many times. That and, yeah, yeah I, because I listen to your podcast, man. <laughs> and don't do a Sam Kwan and say someone from in this building. Okay. I was, uh, okay. Um, Agent Sal. He's, oh, uh, I like that. I messaged him on Instagram and he never got back to me. Oh, yeah. I was he, trying to get him on this podcast. He's yeah, a very so the re- guy on Instagram right here. Yeah, so I met up with uh, him for coffee um, after I think a couple months into the business, and he was showing me all the people that he had on his phone, messaging him and asking him to buy a house from um, through him or asking him to sell a house. So this guy does absolutely no lead generation, and um, he sells more than forty plus homes in the in the GTA market. So he would definitely be a good one to have on. Nice, I like that. Yeah, if you like, I'll I'll reach out to him because I've known him since high school. Um, maybe he'll ha- I'll have a better chance of getting a response. So <laughs> maybe he follows you. <laughs> he didn't go maybe the... he thinks that uh, you're you're trying to uh, you know get him to list his house. <laughs> maybe, and he just puts you at the end of the queue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks so much, Hassan. It's been a pleasure. First time on Sales Beast, but uh, never lost in our hearts. So thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it was an absolute honor and uh, thank you for having me, guys. <laughs>